Hello, everybody. Welcome again to Song and Sword Online Church Community. I'm so glad that you're with us today. Uh, we've got so much to, to talk about and to do. Grab your Bibles. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 this week. Uh, grab something to celebrate communion, uh, the body and blood of Christ at the end of our time in the Word. As usual, let me direct you to songandsword.com. That's our website. You find out stuff about us. You can uh, give uh, in the, hitting the donut button there. And if you want pray, I said donut button. I meant donate button. But you can pray with us and for us. Uh, if you just text prayer to that number on the screen, we'll pray with you and um, lift you up before the Lord. I hope you guys are well. I'm going to jump into the Word today um, because i got so many uh, cool things to share with you about this thing called the Holy Spirit. When I was growing up back in the 1900s, He was the Holy Ghost. As in the song that we sometimes sing, Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And this terminology, which comes, most of you probably know, from the old King James Version, the first authorized English version of the Bible in 1611. Uh, and, it, and it made this, this third person of the Trinity that's already mysterious, really even more mysterious, Holy Ghost. As in, like when I was growing up, Casper the Friendly Ghost, or in The Ghost of Christmas Past, or scary ghost stories that we like to tell in the dark. You know, the kind where you hold the flashlight up to your face and make weird faces. Uh, or even Ghost, as in Ghostbusters, the famous movie, or um, Whoopi Goldberg in uh, the movie Ghost. And even now there's a, there's a TV series called Ghosts. Our cultural impression of ghosts begs the question for a kid uh, in, the, in the 1900s growing up, what in the world is a holy ghost? Is it kind of scary but kind of holy? It's a mind-blowing thing for a kid, and I think it's a mind-blowing thing for many people today. And maybe you didn't grow up in the church or back in the day and you heard the word Holy Ghost. Maybe you're more in line with the term Holy Spirit. Uh, and that's the normal translation that we have in most English versions today, Holy Spirit. The, the word ghost or spirit comes from the Greek word pneuma, which literally means wind or breath of God. Some of you guys probably know that. So we're talking about the Holy Breath, the Holy Wind, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. But whether it's ghost or spirit, it doesn't matter. The wind or spirit of God is for most of us the most mysterious, the most misunderstood, and often the most ignored person of the Trinity of God. Remember, we understand God to be one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three distinct personalities. And the Holy Spirit usually gets kept out of that conversation. But I want you to understand today, we're going to talk about wisdom and power. And without the power of the Holy Spirit, you can never understand the love of the Father or following Jesus Christ, the Son, as Lord. And so these all work together, and today we're going to learn about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Breath and Wind of God. And, and I just want to let you know, I'm not going to solve all the mysteries, or I'm not going to answer all the questions about the Holy Spirit today. The Holy Spirit, number one, is so mysterious Jesus says the Holy Spirit is like the wind. He blows where he wants to and goes back and forth. Where he goes, we don't know. Where he ends, we don't know. Where he comes from, we don't know. The Holy Spirit is mysterious. He's like the wind. But he's also very powerful. The Bible says in the Old Testament that not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So he's mysterious. We can't grasp him. He's powerful. And yet, we need to understand a little bit about him because he lives in us. The promise of the Holy Spirit of God, that God would send His Spirit to live in those of us who follow Jesus Christ. So, who is this Holy Spirit? And even if you're, if you're a, a non-believer today, uh, I want you to stay tuned because this is a fascinating look at this most powerful expression of God the Father. Um, and uh, if you're a believer and you're unsure or you're maybe uneducated about what the Holy Spirit does or who He is, then today we're going to learn about Him as the wisdom and the power of God. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to be in, starting in verse 3. Again, it's a long section, but it's all about the Holy Spirit. So uh, just get your hearts ready and be open to what God might be saying to you right now. Paul continues, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature we do impart a wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood it, 
For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love Him. These things God has revealed to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Holy Spirit, interpreting spiritual things, truths, to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, by, but is himself be, to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Let's ask the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Breath of God to speak to us now. God, would you come in this moment? And uh, I, I'm assuming that there are hundreds of people, if not thousands of people with Bibles open, ready to hear from you. And I know that just like Paul, I, I'm not going to have plausible words of wisdom. I'm not going to have any impressive thing that I can say. But I know that your Holy Spirit testifies to Jesus. So Holy Spirit, God, would you come and move in us now? Would you speak by the power of the Spirit, by the power of Jesus' resurrection and blood? And would you move in us in this time? We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I just want to warn you that this is probably not going to be a, a sermon about the Holy Spirit power that you might anticipate. Remember, Acts chapter 18 is the, the story of Paul's first visit to this uh, mega world-class city called Corinth. Um, and so in chapter 18 of Acts, you get the history of Paul coming into town, starting a church there, and preaching the word of Jesus. He stayed there a whole year and a half preaching and teaching. And to make ends meet, to, to make a living, he joined with these two Christians, Aquila and Priscilla, and they made tents. So imagine Paul's working by day making tents, and during the evening and other times, he's preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. But interestingly, and this is really interesting, you've got to pay attention to this. Unlike most places that Paul began a ministry, we don't have any biblical record of miracles done in Corinth. That's fascinating because this group of people were so into wisdom and power, and Paul easily could have done a bunch of miracles to impress them, but he didn't. That's super interesting for us even today because most people then and now 2,000 years later, maybe even you, you think the Holy Spirit power must be exhibited in visible miracle stuff, you know, taking out enemies, overcoming death, overcoming disease. But in Corinth, the evidence... And in our lives, the evidence is the Holy Spirit works in really powerful ways that are beyond the visible miraculous that we expect. So the Bible says in Acts 18, 5, when Paul came into Corinth, he was occupied with the Word. So he taught the Word, but he also believed in the power of the Spirit, as we just read. What did he believe about the power of the Spirit? Point number one, and this is uh, there on the outline on our website, songandsword.com. The mystery of God is revealed by the power of and wisdom of the Holy Spirit. There's a mystery of God, and it's revealed because of the power and wisdom of the Holy Spirit of God. Here's what it says in verse 7. It says, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom. There's a hidden wisdom here. In fact, this is a very cool word uh, there. If you've if you got your Bibles open, you want to circle that word secret. Uh, it, it's the word in the Greek, mysterio. We get the word mystery from it. There's something mysterious about this thing that God is up to from eternal past, eternity past. There's an eternal, secret, God-sized mystery. And here's the thing. Here's what's powerful about the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal it. Now, Paul goes through a review here, because remember, this is all the context. It, we get thrown off sometimes because Corinthians is 16 chapters and all these different verses. In the day, it was just on a scroll. It was one letter, and Paul sent it. So he's keeping the context of Jesus going, but the mystery of God is not figured out or overpowered or revealed by the world's wisdom and power. Paul wants us to understand that. Look what he says in verse 3. I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. He goes, I didn't come in there cocky and just sure that I was going to convince you guys because I'm a great speaker and I've got all this eloquence and all this wisdom. 
In fact, he keeps the context of the power and wisdom conversation going. It's not about powerful speech. Look at these knots, and again, circle these. Verse 4, our speech and our message was not implausible words of wisdom. In, in verse 6, we, this was not the wisdom of this age. In other words, the smarts of the first century or any century since then is not the way you're going to figure out the wisdom and power of God or this mystery of God. In verse 13, it's not taught by human wisdom, he says again. In verse 8, he says, none of the rulers of this age. In other words, people that have authority and power in the world, they're not the ones that are going to figure out this mystery of God. Um, it, it, verse 12, not the spirit of this world. So there's a, you know, there's, there's a spiritual warfare going on. There's a Holy Spirit power in the world, and there's also the evil spirit world of Satan. John uh, says in 1 John 4, 1, that uh, he warns us to test the spirits to see if they are from God or not. And the one way we know about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit always testifies that Jesus Christ is Lord. But, but Paul says even the spirit of this world, as powerful as it seems, is not going to reveal the mystery of God. And finally, in verse 13, he says again, it's not taught by human wisdom. The mystery, this mystery, that's what we're looking at in verse 7. Remember again, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, a mystery of God from ages past. It is never solved or understood in the wisdom or power of human nature. We need a higher power to understand the mystery of God. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. If you follow along your outlines, I've got it written down this way. Secret and hidden wisdom of God is revealed by the Holy Spirit. That comes from verse 10. He's talking about all this mystery in verses 7 and 9. And then in verse 10, he says, God has revealed to us through the Spirit this incredible mystery. Again, another cool word. You know I'm a word guy, not that smart. I just like words and language. The word is apocalypto. We get the word apocalypse. It's the word revelation. It means to expose or pull back the curtain, to let us see what, what has been pulled back. These things God has pulled back to us through the Holy Spirit, the mystery of God. And here's the question, what is this mystery? What is the big mystery about God? And it's the mystery of the gospel and the message and the power and the wisdom of Jesus Christ crucified. If you didn't see last week's sermon, go back to our YouTube channel and watch it so you can just binge watch some sermons along with us. But last week we talked about the power of Christ crucified. This week, the power of the Holy Spirit testifying and pointing to the wisdom of Jesus Christ. And that's the mystery. That's the mystery. There is a God who in ages before creation came up with a plan for our glory. He decreed it. He set it in place. He determined this is what was going to happen. And, and that plan is, is something that is better, look at it says in verse 9, better than the eye has ever seen. Your eyes never seen as something as cool as this mystery. Your, your ear has never heard the good news as good as this mystery. Your, your heart of man has never imagined. You can't imagine. You can't hear or see or imagine what? Look at the last line. What God has prepared for those who love him. Here's the mystery. Here's the mystery. There's an, import, there's an eternal place of glory for those who by faith in Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, enter into a loving relationship with God and the Spirit reveals to those of us who have believed. That's the mystery. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Believers, if you're sitting here today and you're going, man, I just want to see more Holy Spirit power in my life. I wish I could see the miracles they did in the New Testament and the Old Testament. I wish I could see Jesus walk on water. I just want to see the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, I would tell you, there's nothing the Holy Spirit can do in your life today that's more powerful than to reveal to you this mystery that there's a God of the universe who predetermined before you were born to love you and to save you through His Son, Jesus Christ. You want power? power? There's nothing more powerful than that. And if you're watching today and you're not a follower of God through Jesus Christ, I want to appeal to you for just a moment to think this through. Because you might be thinking, well, we see in this passage that, that the Holy Spirit didn't reveal it to the rulers of this age. Why didn't the rulers of the age get it? You know, Paul says, none of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they did, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. Remember, these rulers, he's talking about the people that put Jesus to death, Pilate inheriting them, right? If they would have understood who he was, they wouldn't have killed him. But the Holy Spirit didn't powerfully reveal or give them wisdom to understand who Jesus was. Why is that? Well, here's the reason. Here's something you need to understand about the Holy Spirit. If you're not a follower of God through Jesus Christ, you don't have faith in Jesus, there's only two ways the Holy Spirit affects you. Number one is by conviction. 
the Holy Spirit might be working on you to say, hey, the way you're going is not right. The way you're going is sinful, and it's going to be harmful to you. It's going to destroy your life. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. The Holy Spirit also testifies about Jesus Christ. He always points to Jesus as the truth and the way and the life. Wherever Jesus is, mentioned or seen or doing something, the Holy Spirit is at work going, yes, that's Jesus. So here's what the Holy Spirit does to non-Christian. He convicts you that you're sinful and you need a Savior, and He tells you that Jesus is that Savior that you need. That's what He does. And so today you might be going, well, what if I'm like these rulers and I don't have a chance? Or I don't, I don't really, um, the Holy Spirit doesn't convict me and move in power in my life. Here's what I'm telling you. Be convicted today. Turn your life to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit likely is at it right now working on you to convict you and point you to Jesus Christ. And if you want to make a decision about Jesus Christ, let us know at songandsword.com. We would love to follow up with you and let you be a part of this mystery, this wisdom that's been hidden from since eternity past. Here's what it says in Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. You, however, talking about Christians, you, however, are not in the flesh, but you're in the Spirit, if in fact the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit of life because of righteousness, the Spirit is, is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him, listen to this, this is awesome. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, who raised Je- uh, then He will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit. If you want to talk about power, the mystery has been revealed that Jesus has died for our sins, the Holy Spirit lives in us, and that same resurrection power that burst open Jesus' tomb on on the third day is the same power that is bringing us to life over time, slowly but surely. That's powerful. There's nothing wiser and more mysterious and more powerful than the work of the sermon uh, of the of the holy spirit that way but because the holy spirit's revealing now we can do this because he's moved into us he's revealed to us this mystery we come to the second point we understand god things by the wisdom and the power of the holy spirit we understand god because the the power and the wisdom of the holy spirit verse 12 we read it earlier but let me read it again We did not have the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God that we might, what? Understand the things freely given to us by God. And we don't receive it any other way except for the Holy Spirit helping us understand. Now, i got to make a point here again. We have received the Holy Spirit. And just in case you're wondering, do you have the Holy Spirit? The Bible says in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. Remember this, the first day of the church, uh, Peter had preached this sermon. He had convicted people. The Holy Spirit had convicted them. And they said, what should we do to be saved? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's, I think, one of the hardest things for Christians. I'll talk about this in just a moment, how you can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. But most of the times we go, yeah, I know the Holy Spirit's in me, The Holy Ghost lives in me. The Holy Breath of God is in me. I just don't feel it. I don't know how to tell that He's there. But this this indwelling is so powerful, it gives us insight and understanding to the things freely given to us by God. I love Paul's explanation and Paul's reasoning here in verse 11. He asks a really interesting question. Who knows the thoughts of a person except the spirit of the person inside, uh, the spirit of that person who lives inside? Right? uh, Put it this way. What are you thinking right now? Quick, what are you thinking? Write it down, think it. Maybe you're thinking, this is a weird question in the middle of a sermon. Maybe you're thinking, I hope this sermon's over soon. Maybe you're thinking that the pastor is incredibly witty and funny. Probably not thinking that. Maybe you're a wife thinking, I wonder what my husband's thinking. Maybe you're a husband thinking, I'm thinking nothing. Maybe you're thinking about what lunch is going to be. Maybe you're thinking about how long is this sermon going to last. I don't know what you're thinking, but here's what I know for sure. The people around you don't truly know what you're thinking. They can guess what you're thinking, but they don't know what you're thinking. Only you know. And Paul says, same way that the spirit of man within him is the only one that knows what he's thinking, that's the way it is with the spirit of God. The spirit of God comprehends all the thoughts of God. Look look at verse 11. No one can comprehend the thoughts of God. And if that's true, if the spirit of God knows what God is thinking, then the spirit living in us can help us understand what God is thinking. That's what it says in verse uh, 12. 
What is God thinking? You ever, I, mean, I ask you a question, what are you thinking? What is God thinking? What's God thinking? Well, uh, the Bible tells us here in verse 12 that the Spirit helps us understand the things freely given to us by God. What is God thinking? God is thinking about our eternal salvation. God is thinking about how much he loves us. See, if the Spirit comprehends the thoughts of God and he helps us understand what God is thinking, then we can understand the things freely giving, given. Now, I, again, I want to point out what you might be thinking about the Holy Spirit, but you might be wrong biblically. Many of us think the Holy Spirit's going to give us this incredible wisdom. That's what the Corinthians were thinking. God's going to give us insight into the Trinity. How can God be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Three personalities, but one God. That's deep theology stuff. That's what God must be thinking. How can, how can God give us free will, and yet he's predetermined times and dates and places and years in our life? How does that work together? Man, maybe the Holy Spirit will reveal that. When is he coming back? When's the end of the world? What's that all going to look like? What are all the things that are happening in the world now? How do they point to that? Man, the Holy Spirit's going to reveal this deep mystery and this deep wisdom. What's going to happen when we die? What's the afterlife like? What do angels do? How do we pray for miracles? How do I understand all the laws of Moses? How do I understand all the Old Testament prophecies? Can I tell you something right now? That's not what this is talking about. Look what it says again. The Holy Spirit helps us understand the things freely given to us by God. I just need to tell you, the Holy Spirit is not going to explain everything to me or you or anybody, no matter how smart they are, all the deep stuff of God we will not understand. He is going to remain a mystery because he's God. But the Holy Spirit is here to help us understand the, freely, the things freely given and, by the way, the most important things. Here's what Paul writes later in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. And this is this prayer for us as Christians, for the Christians in, in Ephesus at the time, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you, listen, strengthen with the power of the Holy Spirit. Awesome. He's going to strengthen us through the power of the Holy Spirit. What? To do miracles, to walk on water, to cast out demons? No. That in your inner being that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So he's going to give me strength. He's going to power to give me faith to keep believing so that I'm rooted and grounded in love. That's the word. That you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know, here it is, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Here's the job of the Holy Spirit. Here's the most powerful thing the Holy Spirit can and will and wants to do in our lives repeatedly. We might understand the things freely given to us by God, and that thing that's freely given to us is His love. Guys, that's all I really know, need to know. And I'm telling you today, if you, if you, along with the Ephesians that the apostle wrote to, and you along with me, if we could just understand, if we had the strength by the power of the Holy Spirit to know the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of the love that God has for us, that would be the most powerful thing in the world. There's nothing more powerful than love. You know that. You've pursued it. The people around you are pursuing it. This culture pursues it. This world is desperately in search for love, and they look for it in so many ways. They look for it in their sexuality, their looks. They look for it in their accomplishment. If, I'm, if I accomplish, people will love me. My parents will finally love me. If I, if I succeed, then, I'll, then the people around me will love me and think that I'm worthy and that I'm good. If I just do this or that, I'll get a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or my husband or wife will love me, my kids will love me, my parents will love me. We spend most of our lives trying to be loved. There's nothing more powerful the desire to be loved, and yet most of the world is missing it. And here's the most powerful thing I can tell you today. There's a spirit who wants to remind you of the depth and the breadth and the length and the height of the love of God through Jesus Christ. There's nothing more powerful the Holy Spirit can do in our lives. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. And if you understand that love, if you understand that love, it's the most powerful thing I can tell you today. So the Holy Spirit helps us understand this ancient mystery that is Jesus Christ who saves us from our sins. And he helps us um, to understand, um, he reveals the ancient mystery, he helps us understand who God is and how much he loves us. 
And then, because he does that, he also teaches us. That's the third and final point. We are taught by the wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit. At this point, you might be like the Corinthians. I know. Because I've been talking about the Holy Spirit for about 25 minutes now, and you're going, when are we going to get to the good Holy Spirit stuff? You might be like the Corinthians. You might be saying, come on, Pastor. What about the real power of the Holy Spirit? What about taking out the enemies of God in miraculous ways? What about laying on of hands and people shaking and, and falling out and being healed and people in wheelchairs getting up and walking and the dead coming back to life? What about speaking in tongues and miracles and prophecies? I want to see and feel the power of the Holy Spirit. Guys, I, I need to tell you something. That, that is what the Corinthians were interested in. And eventually, we're going to do a series as we spend time in, the, in First and Second Corinthians over this year. We're going to talk about all those things. We're going to do a whole series about miraculous gifts of the Spirit, about prophecy, about miraculous um, healing and speaking in tongues. But it may surprise you, and I think it may disappoint you, that the Apostle Paul doesn't consider those things the most powerful aspects of the Holy Spirit. He, the, if, if Paul would come and say, tell me about the power of the Holy Spirit, and we ask him that question, you go, well, I'm not going to start with where you think. The Corinthians want to know about speaking in tongues and miracles and prophecies and all that supernatural cool stuff. Remember, they're stuck on wisdom and power. They want to see it, and it needs to sound smart. And the Apostle Paul says, no, here's the most important thing I can tell you, that, that the Holy Spirit helps you interpret. The Holy Spirit gives you wisdom. Look, in verse uh, 13, we are taught by the Holy Spirit. We're able to interpret spiritual truths. Uh, spiritual truth to those of us who are spiritual. See, the Holy Spirit now, the powerful thing He does in my life now is He continues to teach me the ways of God. Literally, um, the Greek word didasko, which means to instruct. The Holy Spirit is constantly instructing us in the following of God through Jesus Christ. And again, this emphasizes what you hear from me all the time and what you're going to continue to hear from me till the day I die. Here it is. You want to feel the power of the Holy Spirit? You want to know that the Holy Spirit's alive in you? You want to be taught and revealed things of God, the mysteries of God? You, you want to uh, have all these, um, uh, this, this uh, the power and spirit of God in your life evident? Here, here it is. Read the Bible. <laughs> is it that easy, Pastor? Is it just that easy? What, why would I tell you to read the Bible? Here's why. Because the Holy Spirit always shows up in the Bible. You might be saying, oh, I don't feel the Holy Spirit's present. And I'm just going to tell you, you're probably not that much in the Word of God. If you want to feel the Holy Spirit's powerful presence in your life, being in the Word of God, the Bible is one sure way to do that. If the Bible is the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit always searches the deep things of God, and the Holy Spirit in His power always testified to the Jesus of the Bible, then when you read and study and meditate on the Bible, you are opening yourself up to the power and wisdom of the Holy Spirit. I believe that too often, Christians in today's world, we spend too much time waiting for the Holy Spirit to do something miraculous instead of picking up the Bible and letting the power of the Spirit rock our worlds. That's what Paul is saying. The Spirit is here not to do a bunch of magic tricks and impress you and over and over again just, you know, just kind of entertain you. We live in an entertainment culture. The Spirit's not here to entertain us. The Spirit's here to tell us the deep mystery of God, to reveal it to us, to help us understand the deep, deep love of God, the thing three, freely given, and to help us continue to grow by teaching us His ways. If you want the Holy Spirit power and presence in your life, read the Bible. There's four other things I'll give you real quick. You can write them down if you want to. You can musically worship Jesus, because again, every time you say good things about Jesus through music, then the Holy Spirit shows up. You've probably experienced Jesus, uh, worshiping Jesus and the power of the presence of the Spirit uh, as you worship. Hang out with other Jesus followers. One of the reasons I invite you to the chateau every week at 9 and 1030 is so that you can come when other believers have, are filled with the Holy Spirit and they gather together, there's the presence that's very palpable. And finally, you can serve and give in Jesus' name. Anytime you do something in Jesus' name, the Holy Spirit will be there to, to um, uh, testify and witness to that and also to teach you about the Jesus-following way. That's, that's how this whole passage ends. Did you catch it? Verse 16, who's understood the mind of the Lord to instruct him? Well, we can't instruct him, but we have the Holy Spirit instruction inside of us. Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. That's the power of the Holy Spirit, to take someone like me, someone like you, who's not worthy, 
Reveal to them this mystery that God loves them. Help us understand how much He loves us. And then to live inside of us and teach us until we begin to think like Jesus Christ. See, sometimes Christians long for an experience of the Holy Spirit power in their lives, and I get it. But the truth is that the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit does so much more than cast out demons. The power of the Holy Spirit does so much more than give miraculous speaking gifts or bring instant healing or even give a prophetic word. I know that the Holy Spirit can, and I've seen Him do all of those things I just mentioned. But here's the reality, the greatest power of all, greater than all these things that we want to see sometimes, is knowing the mystery of God revealed in Jesus that saves us from our sin. And only the Holy Spirit can, can come into our lives and give us the wisdom and the power to understand those things. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. So I hope he's less uh, weird to you today, the Holy Ghost of the Holy Spirit, and you understand just how powerfully he's working in your lives, which brings us to a time of communion today. Um, remember when Jesus was betrayed from John 13 through 17 is the last supper of Jesus. And the night he was betrayed, he started talking about his body and his blood. So if you have some emblems, grab some bread for the body of Christ, grab some juice for the blood of Christ. And um, but here's the thing that's fascinating to me. The whole time he was saying, I'm gonna have a broken body and I'm gonna shed my blood. I want you to do this in remembrance of me. He keeps talking about, I'm gonna send the helper. I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit. And of course he does. And so even as we come together to share the body and blood of Christ, the Holy Spirit's powerfully in this moment because he's testifying to this. He's reminding us, do this to remember Jesus. And so we break the bread, we take it together to remember the body of Jesus Christ. And by the Spirit power in us, reminding us, showing us, helping us understand, we celebrate the blood of Christ that washes our sins away by taking some juice together. Let's drink together. And so, Father, we thank you. Father, God, Son, Jesus, Holy Spirit, we, we worship you and we thank you that, that all of these come together by the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to make us yours. And we revel, we thank you in the blood of Jesus Christ and the love that you've shown us. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys, we'll see you next week.